This is our second look at the debate between Heyman Mater and Sean McDowell on Unbelievable. You might want to check out video one in the description below. In this video, we want to address an issue that came up in the Q&A, the issue of morality. Here's how the host, Justin Briley, introduced it. This, this brings me back to an episode of Unbelievable that you contributed to a while back, Hemant. I don't know if you'll remember it, but I, I brought you on with um, uh, Leah Labresco, who was a former uh, co-blogger on the Atheist channel of the Pathos oh, yeah. Network. But she actually converted to Christianity, interestingly. Mm. And part of her conversion was um, coming to believe that there really was objective moral truths in the world, moral values and duties. Um, and for her, that was the thing that brought her across the, the line from atheism to believing there's a God. She felt that you cannot um, have a world of real objective moral facts and duties and truths without there being something beyond simply matter and motion to ground it. She believed there had to be a God to, to ground that. Now, when I, I remember when you came on to discuss that with her, you just, you just couldn't, didn't understand why that had, had, had taken her there. I hadn't heard this episode of Unbelievable that Justin references, so I went back into the archives. It's pretty great. Leah Labresco was an atheist blogger who converted to Catholicism based on the moral argument for God. Here on that show from six years ago, she asks Heyman what grounds his morality. And I'd be curious to know from Heyman, you know, what he thinks grounds his morality when, you know, when you run into someone who's a postmodernist or a nihilist who says, you know, well, why are you saying you have anything except preferences? Why should your preferences be binding on me any more than aesthetic preferences are? Um, I prefer Stephen Sondheim to Andrew Lloyd Webber. Now, I, I might maintain that's an objectively true thing, uh, but what is it about your preferences that means there are anything more than aesthetic preferences as applied to human action rather than art? I still have no idea what that question is saying. <laughs> well, I, I mean... He, okay, let, well, let, Hammond, if, if you prefer certain art to other art, you wouldn't expect someone else to hew to your preferences. That's if true. If you prefer certain actions to other actions, you have this expectation that people will share your preferences, that there's something universal that means that they should find those preferences compelling. I mean, you obviously believe that reason, at least, is universal and compelling because you think that I should have an argument that is compelling to all people and, like, a logical therapist when they read it. Why is it that when it comes to moral questions, you think they're more like reason and less like art? Great question. When I say I don't think a culture should treat women as less valuable than men, how do I want that view to be heard? Am I expressing a moral ought or just an aesthetic preference? Great question. Totally legit question. Heyman struggles. Why is it that when it comes to moral questions, you think they're more like reason and less like art? I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. I don't know that everyone should have the same morality, and I, I know that they don't, and not every answer, not everyone's going to agree with my morality versus someone else's. I think you can have good reasons for choosing different paths than that sense. Well, then what's the heuristic by which you check? Some people, you know, I think we both agree some people have, like, bad things that they value or, you know, misapplied priorities or just actually, you know, value bad things in the case of, uh, you know, uh, the Taliban structure of morality where women are counted as less than human. Uh, is there something that they're missing that means that they're, like, missing out on a fact that would tell them that's not true? Is that an arbitrary distinction and, you know, you just don't share their beliefs, but there's not a reason they should share yours? That women should be treated equally? That's what I believe. That's what you believe. Like, and right. some people don't believe that. What's the reason by which they should come to believe what we believe rather than say, oh, people all have different ideas? Heyman is struggling with something he doesn't want to have to struggle with. He wants to be able to say what any of us would want to say. Of course, we should treat women as equal to men. The trouble is he has philosophical commitments that make it hard for him to say this. If we are just matter in motion, where does this should come from? It's not written into the material world, so why should we treat the sexes equally? What's the reason other than some religious person told them otherwise, or they interpreted some holy book as being right, so they're just following that step? I mean, I, I still don't get how we have to deviate from someone who deviates from saying people are treated equally or treated equally. I, I suppose what Leah's asking, asking is essentially what grounds your belief 
in the equality of human beings. Do, do what kind of would you point someone to? I didn't realize that needed justification. But beliefs need justifications, right? As a rational person, Hamet is keen on ensuring all our beliefs are justified. He insists on it in every other context. And here's the thing, in most other cultures in the history of the world, people have not thought that men and women are equal. I mean, it's great that in the West we take the equality of the sexes for granted, but that is largely because it's written on the very first page of the Bible. But if we're going to throw the Bible away, what justifies our belief in equality? Tell me why the sexes are equal. Or are there moral facts out there in the universe, axioms that need no justification, morality that just is? Well, Heyman isn't going to want to say that, because that doesn't fit with his materialist beliefs. It would sound way too religious to believe that there are immaterial moral values that are foundational to reality. That kind of thought might lead you down Leo Labresco's path. So Heyman is going to have to come up with a justification. He thinks of the sexes as equal. The Taliban thinks of them as unequal. What exists up here to say that the Taliban is wrong and he's right? It's a question that Justin Briley put to Heyman. You, you've already referenced the fact, well, it's a better world when we live like this. Well, that's the whole point. How, it, to what standard are you appealing when you say better? I guess the only uh, standard <laughs> I'm appealing to is that from, you know, from the tradition we have, from the history we have, that's, that seems to be a world where people are happiest, where people are doing, uh, where people are treating each other equally. Uh, everyone gets along better. As soon as you start putting other people down, uh, all of a sudden you're setting yourself up for conflict and that's something religion has done over and over again. But, but again, aren't these all value laden? We're better off. It's a worse world where there's conflict. Um... So people are happier and get along better when you treat everyone as equal. But A, why is a happier society morally better? And B, I think we can all imagine societies where treating some people unequally will lead to all sorts of added happiness. Certainly it can lead to great economic and social gains. Slave owners, for instance, were happier having slaves, not to mention richer. And slavery built whole civilizations. Those civilizations, from one point of view, ran much more smoothly, powered by slave labor. In fact, when Britain abolished the slave trade in 1833, it cost the government 20 million pounds. That was 40% of the national budget, the equivalent of 17 billion pounds in today's money. That was a debt that took 182 years to pay off. We only finished paying it off in 2015. See, the arguments for slavery were obvious. It was economically lucrative. But on the other side, people kept pointing to the Bible and saying equality was better. It wasn't better for the economy. It wasn't better for a smoother running society, but it was right. But does Hamant have a category for right that goes beyond social preferences? Unfortunately, I don't think he does. And even more unfortunately, I don't think he sees the problem with not having it. Well, that was six years ago. And then a year later, he released this video on his Atheist Voice channel, which again deals with the moral argument. Did he learn anything from his conversation with Leah? Sadly, I don't think so. So a question comes up, what are things Christians should not say to atheists? First one, where do you get your morality from? Don't assume that because we're atheists, we don't have morals. We all have morals, we all have ethics. Ours don't derive from a holy book. Um, and I would hope that your Bible isn't the only reason you're not out there killing everybody in sight. So Heyman is tired of being asked the question, where do you get your morality from? But I wonder if he's tired of it because he misunderstands it. Because Christians are not asking you, do you have morals? They're asking you, where do you get them? Those are different questions. It would be like someone asking, Hey, Paul, where'd you get your trousers from? Oh man, I'm so sick of people asking me that question. No, because I like your trousers. Where did you get them from? Why do you keep assuming that I don't have trousers? I have trousers, all right. I know you have trousers. That's why I'm asking. Where, where did you get them Look, from? Look, I have trousers, and they're just as good as your trousers, if not better than your trousers. Your trousers are great, but where did you get them? Look, stop disparaging my trousers. I've had enough of it. These are fabulous, fabulous trousers. The question, where do you get your morals, is a good question. It's not the question, do you have a morality? It's the question, where is it from? What's the justification for it? What are your foundations for morality in a materialistic universe? That seems a perfectly good question. And it's just the sort of question Leah and Justin were asking him about. But one year on from that, he still has no answer. Even when he's the one posing the question to himself, he somehow still manages to dodge it. He never tells us where he gets his morality from. He just reassures us that he has one and he doesn't need the Bible. But that is to misunderstand the objection. I don't think you need a moral book to tell you what's moral. 
I do think you need a moral universe, but that's the kind of thing Heyman doesn't want to acknowledge. Let me put it this way, if you come across a box of self-assembly furniture pieces, you can put the furniture together without the IKEA instruction manual. And let's imagine that I'm a real stickler for reading the manual and you never bother. That's fine, we can both assemble the furniture. You might even be better at it than me. No problem. You might even say, everyone is better off without the manual. Okay, you might want to say the manual's rubbish and we should all do away with the manuals. Fine. But it's much harder to deny the existence of IKEA. And what you can't do is say there's no such thing as furniture. This is the heart of the moral argument. It's not that you need a moral book, it's that you need a moral nature to the universe. And a moral nature to the universe is an immaterial value that is not located in matter. That's why Leila Bresco gave up her materialistic philosophy, and this is the problem that Heyman still doesn't seem to understand. But Leah was 2012, that YouTube clip was 2013, and it's now 2018. Heyman has had six years to reflect on his last interaction on Unbelievable. Has he updated his thinking? That's what Justin asks him. This, this brings me back to an episode of Unbelievable that you contributed to a while back, Heyman. I don't know if you'll remember it, but I, I brought you on with um, uh, Leah Labresco, who was a former uh, co-blogger on the atheist channel of the Pathos oh, yeah. Network. But she actually converted to Christianity, interestingly. Mm. And part of her conversion was um, coming to believe that there really was objective moral truths in the world, moral values and duties. Um, and for her, that was the thing that brought her across the, the line from atheism to believing there's a God. She felt that you cannot um, have a world of real objective moral facts and duties and truths without there being something beyond simply matter and motion to ground it. She believed there had to be a God to, to ground that. Now, when I, I remember when you came on to discuss that with her, you just, you just couldn't, didn't understand why that had, had, had taken her there. I don't know whether your thinking has progressed on that in any way in the, in the few years since, but are you, do you find this in any way a kind of plausible it's, or interesting argument? It's still not a convincing argument to me. I don't know anyone who's followed her down that path. I know, would, a, I know a few people, okay. uh, but, but yes, you haven't um, personally come into contact and, with And I don't, I don't think I necessarily buy into there's an objective truth about all of this stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's what we bring to the table that okay. kind of creates those... So truths. you're not sure there is an objective moral nature to, to the world? No, because people disagree about even simple stuff now. Uh, okay, so there isn't an objective moral nature to the world. Heyman is clear on that, at this point anyway. And the fact people disagree, uh, Heyman says that's evidence of the fact that it's all subjective. Sean's going to deal with that in a second, but here Sean brings things down to a concrete example. Okay. But you think it's, just for clarification, you think it's objectively wrong to sexually abuse a child. Would you say that yes. is... So you I do believe No, 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 hang on, let me answer truth. that. Let me finish my answer on that. No, I think it's obviously, that's horrible, that's wrong. Oh, well, maybe there is an objective moral standard. Here, Heyman seems pretty emphatic on the wrongness of abusing a child. But something tells me he's not going to stick with his objective judgment. I think, this is the thing, that to me seems like a black and white issue. Child abuse does seem like a black and white issue. Something tells me a but is coming, though. But again, there's plenty of, black, I think, uh, killing people should, you would think that would be an objective truth, but we live in a country where we have the death penalty. There are nations that are firmly religious that kill people because they think that's the right punishment for whatever the crime is. I mean, yes, I, I agree with you. Like, no, sexually, we should never sexually abuse anyone. We should punish anyone who do. But I'm saying there are a lot of things that we think are pretty hardcore, this has to be wrong, that we will find people who are arguing the other side to that. So the argument is that moral judgments can be difficult to make and people disagree. And therefore, says Heyman, we can't know any objective standard. Sean replies, That's So the fact that some people are wrong doesn't mean there's not an objective truth. Totally. People have been on opposing sides of all sorts of matters of fact. That doesn't mean there's not a right answer. And Sean drives home the point. But are, are there some things that are indubitably true, like two plus two equals four, the earth is round, and it's wrong to sexually abuse a child? Like, all you have to do is have one thing, and there is objective truth, whether it's in science or morality. There is a difference between, it. like, a mathematical fact and these moral ideas that we... 
that we interpret. I mean, only the same in sense of being objective, being outside of us. I agree that they're different in other respects. Yeah, but I don't know where this game is going. The game is not really a game. It's the place we live every day. We live every day making moral judgments, judgments of better and worse, right and wrong. It's a basic building block of human experience, but Hamid is fudging here, even when the examples are really clear cut, like torturing a child. And the question is why? Why is he fudging? The answer, surely, is that he has philosophical commitments that mean he has to twist or ignore some of the most basic realities of human experience. It's true that maths and morals are different kinds of truth, and they're investigated in different kinds of ways. But just because morals are different than maths doesn't mean they're less real. Certainly we all experience the world as a moral domain, but Heyman's atheism makes him less able to handle real life. Justin points this out. I, I think you've asked where, where is this game going. I think where the game is going is is was Leah Labresco right to change her mind about God because she said if it's true that it's objectively wrong to sexually abuse children then she's that can... a Catholic <laughs> that church has a lot of problems okay. with that watch what Sean McDowell does here genius move I but... agree you're absolutely right <laughs> so you're you're absolutely right so the condemnation of the church you and I both stand no, I against know. that and of say course. it's wrong it's wrong Child abuse is wrong. Heyman knows it's wrong. His blog is dedicated to pointing out the wrongness of things like child abuse. So it seems that Heyman lives on the basis that there are objective moral values, even though his materialistic philosophy doesn't allow him them. Sean sums up the problem brilliantly. Well, I, look, one of the videos you had is that atheists can't, that Christians often say to atheists, you can't be moral if you don't believe in God. That's crazy. Of course, you defend, you're like, no, atheists can have ethics. And your blog is regularly condemning certain behavior that religious people do. And I actually agree with you. When I read some of your blog, I grieve because these are my people. I'm like, him and his right, like that's an abuse of power that's taking advantage of people. Like it pains me, I can only read it so much. But that's because you're Try writing you, it. <laughs> well, I agree, like I, I'm, I'm with you. So <laughs> the reason we agree on this is because we do think there's an objective, moral, truth about this. It's really wrong. And that raises questions. Where does this come from? Is there actually a standard? Do humans have intrinsic value? Is there free will? So I think atheists can be moral, but I don't think atheism can ground the moral project, which seems to be central to everything you do on your blog. That's why I think it's a pretty important question. Perfectly put by Sean, of course atheists can be moral. They can be more moral than Christians. In fact, it's a fundamental belief of Christians that atheists can be more moral. They can be more moral than us because for us the word more actually means something. There is a standard that judges both me and my atheist friend and by that standard my atheist friend can be more moral than me. But if my atheist friend is a relativist, then they can't be more moral than me, they can only be different. And then our differences become just like taste in music. I like jazz music and slavery, you like rock music and human rights, takes all sorts I suppose. But actually no one lives like this. No Christian lives like this and no atheist lives like this. We all live as though there are real objective moral values. But what is it that justifies our belief in real moral values? Sean has put his finger on three vital foundations. We think there's a moral standard, we think humans have intrinsic value, and we believe humans are free to make ethical choices. Those are foundational to ground your ethics. You need a moral standard, the intrinsic worth of humans, and a non-deterministic world where we can actually choose the good. The trouble is, materialism cannot give us this. Materialism says that reality boils down to molecules. It's all matter in motion. But none of us live like this. We all know there are many other immaterial aspects to reality that are at least as vital, if not more. In addition to matter in motion, there are minds and meaning and metaphysics and morals and maths and music and miracles and mercy. And you can't put any of those things under a microscope. But why would we imagine that they're any less real because of that? We need all these M's to lead a meaningful life. In fact, we need a heck of a lot of those M's just to do material science. Minds, metaphysics, maths at least. Actually, materialism itself depends on immaterial realities. Think about it. Materialism is not written into the molecules. Materialism is such a self-contradictory philosophy, it belongs on the immaterial side of the equation. Materialism, the doctrine that all there is is matter in motion, only actually exists as metaphysic in human minds. In other words, materialism is an immaterial reality that posits that matter is all there is. 
and the moral argument for God's existence is just one of many that show up this inconsistency. We know that these immaterial M's are vital, even though they don't show up in the scientific experiments. In fact, we can't do without them. Morality, like these other M's, is not detectable by the scientific method, but that does not mean it's not real. Its reality is so obvious, even a committed materialist like Hamant cannot help invoking it. Well, of course, because we live in that kind of world. You can tear up the IKEA instruction manual, but those four legs and that flat surface make a table. There is a shape to reality that cannot be denied. I, I hope Hamant keeps building his tables, I hope he keeps taking moral judgments as seriously as he does, and I pray it'll take him beyond his materialism to the morals, the minds, music, maths, miracles, meaning, and mercy at the heart of it all.